Love live life. Life can be glorious and hideous. Stick your feet to the ground, but don't think you are counted out. Don't let the wind pull you and tear you apart. Let yourself live freely and love, and you'll be happy. No limits, just to keep on. Hey guys, and welcome back to another Iron Will podcast with me, Shane Warner, and John Chase. So what this podcast is all about is we are trying to get stories from people that have been through a traumatic experience in their lives and came out a different person. Yeah, they have all created an Iron Will. So what is an Iron Will? A burning determination that cannot be stopped or hindered by anything. Willing to do anything to get a desired outcome. Extremely resilient. So what we like to say is we like to say, just keep punching. (laughs) Yeah. So sit back and relax and we're going to start the show. Um, Okay. You ready to start? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, So today we have on Jeff Forrester on um the podcast with us and how i know jeff is actually i started following him i think from um he was following following seth howland and he just seemed like a really interesting guy and i found out after that he wrote actually wrote a book and it's called unleashed potential and his name is Jeff Forrester, and we're just going to have him kind of introduce himself and tell a little bit about his background story and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So here he is, Jeff Forrester. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly how we met was, and I say met, is 2020 yeah. has a whole new version of oh, meeting yeah. people. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> but but it's, it's fantastic, though, is, yeah, I had found... Seth Howland, he had heard me on an episode of Three of Seven Project. Okay. And so I started following. We, he and I connected because we connected on being former fat kids. Oh. That was really how, <laughs> how the first part of the conversation, I get yeah. a message. He's like, I used to be a fat kid too. <laughs> and uh, so awesome. I started following him and we went back and forth. He, and he's such a good guy. Yeah, he's a great oh, dude. He's fantastic. We're and, actually interviewing him um, again the early part of January. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and it's, it, I feel like from, even though I've never met him is that we've developed a really cool friendship. And then I saw him put up where you guys were going to interview him or you did interview him and that podcast came out. And so then that's how I found you. Yeah. And, cool. um, and, yeah. and hearing a little bit about your story is great. So the background for me is I, I would say is I, I, let it into it a little bit as, as being a former fat kid (laughs) and where that comes from is, and it's, it's weird. The growth that I've had to be able to make that admission and it it hasn't always been there because it was, um, you know, growing up overweight, you get a lot of family members that programmed me of, well, this is just the way you are. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm a yeah, big and kid. They, I've got a pretty large frame. They mm-hmm. probably like uh, explain to you like that you're not going to be good at sports and stuff like that. Did, did anyone trying to be nice to set you up yeah, so then did you don't have anyone failure. ever say that to you? Not the sports. So my mom and dad were not sports people. Okay. Uh, and so I didn't have that part of it, but it was the, you know what? You're just a big kid. Cause a lot of the other people in my family, not in my immediate family, but I had um, some aunts and uncles that were overweight as well. Mm, yeah. And so I would just get this constant feedback from friends and other people. Cause I was the biggest kid in school is that we well, are just big bone. That's yeah. just the way we are. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, and I think it's, it's terrible when people program other people because they're afraid of accomplishing something and they've, sure. they've come to, accept that they're they're overweight and so therefore they want other people to be in the same category as they mm-hmm. are. Now oh. I don't yeah. I don't think it was that malicious. I think it's an undertone yeah. that happens. 
And, and so for me, as I grew up fat and I, and I also had a fixed mindset in the sense of, I ran away from anything that was hard. And that's something that, and I don't know where that came from per se. I know my mom and she's an amazing woman and she's endured a lot of hardship in her life, but she's very, very risk averse. (laughs) That's really important for you to make that realization. Sure. And did you make that realization when you were a kid or was that later on in life? Oh goodness. No. Um, it was, it's been just, I would say within the last, like to really understand and admit that I ran away from hard stuff. It's just been in the last couple of years. Okay. Mm. All right. Yeah. Cause it was, cause I, and, and I look at problems that have occurred in my life and it's because I've avoided hard things. Yeah. And I wanted to either numb the hard things out of my life or I wanted to avoid them completely, make excuses about why they're hard and why I can't do that or I shouldn't do it. And so, and, and it all, and I, and again, I don't, I don't know specifically where that part came from. I do feel like that in many instances, people can be nurtured to have a fixed or a growth mindset. Yeah. Sure. But some, it some can. people are just born to just do hard things. They just, yeah. you, they're the kid in the neighborhood that's climbing the trees, jumping out. They're having no, no fear whatsoever. And then you had me that was just easing their way down the tree. <laughs> I wanted to climb the tree, <laughs> but then when I got up there, I'm yeah. the one that's hollering for mom or dad to come get <laughs> yeah. me down from the tree. Um, so my, my childhood was interesting because I was raised in a family of entrepreneurs. My dad had his own mm-hmm. business, his own toy store. Mm-hmm. And I saw the ugly side of entrepreneurship in the mm-hmm. sense of it wasn't, it was not sexy by any means. Yeah. It, it, wasn't, was, it wasn't inspiring. Like how we, we try to promote make it. On, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It, it had no elements of Instagram mm-hmm. you know, or any yeah, of the social sure. media that, that people portray. And it was hard work um, it was a toy store, so it wasn't like we were having to dig ditches or, or do anything like that. But it was still, it was long hours that yeah. he put in, mm. lots of sacrifice that took him away from the family. Sure. And no savings account, no, you know, just all those things that people just don't think about. And so I was raised in that. And if you remember, I just said, I don't like hard things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so seeing that, I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't understand it. And then he got trapped. He didn't have a college degree, Mm -hmm. didn't know what he would want to do because he had invested so much of his life into this business. And at the age of 47, so this was my senior year in high school, it was the Wednesday. He had been sick for a while. And so they thought it was Mm -hmm. walking pneumonia. And the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, he went into the hospital for a lung biopsy because they saw something on the x-ray and they weren't sure. And so that day is when my adult life started. And, and how found, old were you at the time? 14, 14? 17. Okay. 17. Oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Senior in high school. Senior, yeah. And this was 1990. And now don't, it, again, he was the sole breadwinner. My mm-hmm. mom supported him, stay at home mom as well. <clears throat> and so now he's, he's in the hospital and they realize he's got, I'm sure it was stage four lung cancer. It mm. spread to his brain already. Wow. Um, and so mm. they were going to start chemo like that day. And wow. so, you know, here I am on Wednesday. My mom's like, we have to go into the hospital. Yeah. So I, I need you to go open the store because I don't know where we're going to go. So I, had, I was going to a small Christian private school. And so they were like, yes, just don't come to school. It's fine. We'll get your, mm-hmm. your assignments to you. So I go and open the store, not realizing what we were about to start to face mm-hmm. as a family. And, and again, I avoided everything that was hard. We, we were a good Southern family in the sense of you don't talk about anything. If you don't talk about mm-hmm. it, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So, yeah. um, don't you wish that, that was the, <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. I mean, if we could just like ignore it and it went away, but yeah, I would never to, talk about COVID, but man. it builds, <laughs> builds up stronger. It does. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. have to, you, yeah. you have to. And, and I, I realize that now. And so, um, you know, with his diagnosis of 
lung cancer, he started chemotherapy and it just, mm. it wrecked his body. Okay. He, he was not a sports guy, but he was, you know, fairly good shape, um, had a wonderful attitude and, and just, he was, he was my hero, even though I didn't spend much time with him because he worked all the time. He was still somebody that I knew he loved me. I knew that he supported me, sure. but I, but it was weird looking back. I did not have a relationship with him. Yeah. And that was, that's, that's the one regret that he had. And then one of the, the things that, that makes me sad that we didn't have it. Yeah. And, um, and you kind of ran out of time to, to, yeah. uh, yeah. Yeah. Cause he passed away eight months later. Okay. Oh, um, man. and, and so we, you know, I ran the store, so I was able to go to school in the morning and then open the store at nine o'clock and then work till seven and then get my homework turned in and then go back and do it again. Wow. And while my mom was his primary caregiver. And so he passed away July after I graduated. So he had told, told my mom, he's like, I just want to live and to see him graduate. And he did. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was one of those things that's great. That, that strength and determination, you can will yourself to do certain yeah. things. And I know Shane, that's like your thing. Yeah. I yeah. will. Yep. Um, and so, and that, you know, with that is I, I, I learned a lot, but I also went into my head a lot because I'd always been a a kid who lived in his head a whole bunch and I didn't know how to process it. And people Mm -hmm. didn't know how to help me process losing my dad. There was anger Mm -hmm. there, but I'm not an angry guy, but I just didn't know how to do it. So I ignored it. And, and then from there went to college, finished college. And then again, like I said, of running away from hard things and my mom being risk averse, you know, here I am having an opportunity to run my own business, Yeah, you know, in my twenties and, and, you know, I'll look back and go, man, I should have just stuck with it. But, but I also, you can't have any regrets. And so from that is, that's when I started my, my real professional, somewhat corporate Mm -hmm. career. We closed the store because I saw again, the ugly side that my dad Mm -hmm. had. You just, like, did, did you sell it to someone or? Well, we wanted to, cause we had put so much. So my dad mm-hmm. had purchased it from a gentleman, oddly enough, a toy store. His name was Mr. Jolly <laughs> and he had purchased it from him in 1969. So at wow. the time it was, you know, a budding 22 year old business. And then mm-hmm. um, by the time we got ready to sell it in 97, you know, it's almost a 30 year old business. And yeah. So, well. We had a lot invested in the name and people only wanted to give us money for whatever the inventory was and the, um, all the, the fixtures that we had in there. Mm-hmm. And that's when my mom and I were like, Nope, we're not just going to give this thing away. We'd rather close it, mm-hmm. sell everything off and okay. then just in that versus selling some, just giving somebody the name. Yeah. And, sure. and I don't know if that was the right thing to do or if that was the emotional thing that we did, but it was something that we, we came to the conclusion together. Um, and then I started the, you, you know, just that, that journey into hoping somebody else would take care of me. So yeah. it's that professional side of, well, let me go work for corporate America. It's 1997. And you know, I'll be safe working for somebody else. Okay. Well, that's kind of a, <laughs> a misleading yeah, um, really story. Um, so I worked in the technology um, arena for uh, two years selling Wi-Fi and really um, hmm. wireless internet solutions to schools that it was at its infancy. Yeah, for sure. Then, at that time. Um, yep. And shifted from there. And then where I've been, the majority of my career in 99, I started in the pharmaceutical industry. And so I've worked Hmm. in several different capacities within that healthcare market, um, up until now. Okay. And, um, so can you tell me like, were you always a writer? Um, because like I said, you wrote a book called unleashed potential, but did you always had a have a passion for writing? Like, did you ever have a journal or anything like that? It's a great question. And so I would say no. So I, I'd heard that I was a PR major, so I took some writing classes, mm-hmm. public speaking classes and different things in, in college, but I wasn't what I would consider a writer. So I and it 
there's so much now that people understand about journaling that I didn't understand. I thought mm. like my, my journaling concept was the Brady Bunch diary. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, mm-hmm. and you write down different things, but nobody, nobody really explained to me what, 